G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for another trade related video. This time taking a look at some of the players that have been traded in the past that went on to explode to become elite or close to elite level players. So it was tough sort of formalizing the criteria for this video. I guess it was more looking at players that we didn't necessarily know we're gonna become very, very good players at the next level. You know, for instance, just plucking one out of thin air, Taylor Adams got traded from GWS to Collingwood, become a very, very good player, but we kind of saw that coming because he was a high draft pick and his trade reflects that. So in this video, we're more looking at players that had maybe stagnated at their previous club or it wasn't quite obvious that this player had the elite attributes to make them the player that they would eventually become. There is a little bit of overlap in this video with the last video I did highlighting the AFL trade bargains in the past because there are some examples here where players were traded for a very low sort of price and then it went on to far exceed what that price was worth. So in this video I've highlighted my 10 best examples and I've thrown in a few honorable mentions as well. As always guys, don't forget to check out the sponsors of today's video, manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping on their elite male grooming products. Now let's crack straight into the video and the first player I'm gonna highlight is a player that I'm gonna pluck straight out of the last video I did from the trains, but Josh P. Kennedy, who was a father-son selection for the Hawthorne Footy Club, got traded to the Sydney Swans. He played just 13 games at the Hawks and it wasn't quite clear whether or not this kid really had the attributes to be an elite AFL player. I'm sure if Hawthorne had any idea the sort of player that Kennedy he was going to become they never would have traded away a father-son pick like that but they sent him and Ben McGlynn to the Swans for pick 39 46 and 70 and Josh Kennedy had only played 13 games up to this point as I said in my last video this qualifies as one of the biggest trade bargains of all time he's obviously played 266 games for the club he's won three best and fairest three all Australians and he's the current club captain as well so fair to say Kennedy is the example of a player who exploded far beyond what people were expecting after he got traded the second player I will highlight is Bashar Hooley, who few people may remember, actually used to be an Essendon player, and he actually used to have hair back then as well. Hooley spent four years at the Essendon Footy Club playing just 26 games, and I think it's fair to suggest he didn't really project to be an elite running halfback that he would eventually become at the Richmond Footy Club. In fact, he was technically delisted from Essendon and redrafted through the preseason draft at peak one to the Richmond Footy Club. So while it's not technically a trade, I thought it was worth highlighting because as we know, Hooley would play 206 games for the Richmond Tigers, winning three premierships. He was all Australian in 2019 as well, and arguably deserved at least one Norm Smith medal as well. As Richmond come toward the end of this premiership cycle, you would think, I think Basha Hooley's retirement will prove to be one of the harder players to replace on that list. He was such a good quality halfback flanker, really driving attacks through the back half with his speed. He will go down as a bit of a Richmond legend, I'm sure, and I'm sure Essendon are kind of kicking themselves that they missed out on Basha Hooley's career. The next example of a player who kind of exploded after being traded was Tim Membry, who was originally drafted by the Sydney Swans at pick 46, and he only lasted two years before requesting a trade back home to Victoria. Given that he was a third round draft selection and only played one game at Sydney in the two years he was on that list, it obviously wasn't that clear how well Tim Membry was going to project at AFL level. His career at the Saints didn't start super quick. He only kicked seven goals from 12 games in his first season, but his output exploded the following year, kicking 44 goals from 17 games. Overall, in his time at St Kilda, he's played 131 games, kicking 223 goals, and is one of the better genuine third tall options up forward in the game, I would say. Again, plucking a player from a previous video I've done. I'm going to go with Jared Witts as a player who far exceeded expectations when he was traded for virtually nothing from Collingwood to the Gold Coast Suns. When I say virtually nothing, it was picks 44 and pick 62 after he had played 40 games across five seasons for Collingwood. But that relatively modest trade price doesn't really reflect the player that Witts would go on to become at the Gold Coast Suns. He would win their best and fairest and be the club captain eventually as well. So while he may not be an elite player, for a while there he was probably one of the best rucks in the game outside of the obvious Gorn and Grundy and as I said in my last video in his last three full seasons he's been ranked first third and fourth in total hitouts. Collingwood won't miss this guy too much considering they have a player called Brody Grundy on their list but it certainly wasn't obvious at the time of the trade that Jared Witts would go on to be a very very good ruckman for Gold Coast. Next up is a player close to my heart I'm talking about Elliot Yo, who was originally drafted by the Brisbane Lions at pick 30 in the 2011 draft. Given he was a pick 30 it's fair to suggest that he wasn't necessarily seen as a future elite midfielder. He did have some very nice attributes, being tall, strong, really quick, and really good overhead. And he carved a 
niche pretty early for the Lions as a running defender across 27 games before requesting a trade home to Perth. Having just played 27 games, it wasn't really obvious to anyone other than who supported Brisbane just how talented Elliot Yeo was. I'm sure they were pretty devastated to lose him, but it would be at the Eagles where he would realize his full potential winning two All-Australians since then and two best and fairest at West Coast, including one in a premiership year. Next up, I'll nominate Jared Lyons, who was originally traded from the Adelaide Crows to the Gold Coast Suns before being delisted somehow with a year remaining on his contract and joining the Brisbane Lions. Now, understandably, he was a bit of a slow burn talent at the Adelaide Crows and it took to his fifth season before he averaged more than 20 possessions in a game. After his trade from Gold Coast, he put together two pretty good seasons, averaging around the 24 mark in terms of disposals before his delisting caused a bit of confusion. And from my understanding, there was a bit of innuendo about his attitude not really aligning with Gold Coast. But despite all that, he signed a contract with the Brisbane Lions as a delisted free agent. And it's fair to suggest he's emerged as a very, very good midfielder of the competition with 2021 being his breakout season, averaging 28 possessions. On top of that, he was ranked third in tackles this year and eighth in clearances. And it's fair to suggest that Jared Lyons has well and truly repaid the faith that Brisbane showed him. Next up, we'll nominate Jack Steele as a player who definitely exploded after being traded. He was originally doing his apprenticeship at the GWS Giants, spent a number of years there before being traded back to St. Kilda for a 2017 second round pick. Now, even at the time, I think it was relatively obvious that Jack Steele definitely had the qualities to be a decent AFL player, but it certainly would have been hard to predict him becoming one of the better midfielders in the competition. Again, the Giants were squeezing out a lot of talent, particularly in that midfield. You had guys like Trelaw and Adams lead that team as well. And Jack Steele could prove to well and truly be the best midfielder that's left the Giants. He finished third, I think, in the Brownlow in 2020, finished top five in 2021 with back-to-back -back All Australians as well. He's an absolute brute of an inside midfielder, and it's fair to suggest he's well and truly hit his straps since that trade. Going back a little bit further in time now, we've got Josh Gibson, who, again, not many people may remember, he used to be a North Melbourne kangaroo. He put together 65 solid games for the Roos before requesting a trade to the Hawthorne Footy Club at the end of 2009 and few people would have predicted back then his ascension to being an elite player under Alistair Clarkson. He would win three premierships at the Hawthorne Footy Club winning an All-Australian jumper in 2015. I do think there's a bit to be said for the effect that Alistair Clarkson had on a player like Josh Gibson. Gibson wasn't necessarily this future elite talent that needed time to blossom. He was a good solid role player and put in Alistair Clarkson's defensive setup really shone and really took his game to the next level. It's certainly not too much of a stretch to say that almost his entire legacy is from him wearing a Hawthorne jumper and not a North Melbourne one. Next, we'll talk about a player called Jack Crisp, who of course plays for the Collingwood Footy Club, but he used to play for the Brisbane Lions before he was involved in the Dane Beams trade. Now, as I did suggest in a recent video on the channel, Jack Crisp was kind of considered the steak knives as part of a bigger deal that saw Dane Beams head from Collingwood to Brisbane. It was originally going to be picks 5 and 25 for Dane Beams, but Collingwood insisted on Jack Crisp being part of that deal as well. He's been a consistently good player for Collingwood across the, I think it was 157 consecutive games he played for that footy club, including having a spot in the 2018 grand final side. He won the best and fairest this year, capping off a great breakout season. And on top of that, he's going to be a great player going forward for them as well. Still in his prime, but well and truly, you'd have to suggest exceeded the expectations that people had of him when he was first part of that trade. Next, we'll talk about Tom Lynch of the Adelaide Variety, who started his career at the St Kilda Footy Club after being drafted at pick 13 in the 2008 draft. Lynch managed just six games across his first three seasons at St Kilda before being involved in the deal that saw Ivan Marich get to Richmond and Tom Lynch would join Adelaide. Tom Lynch is pretty well known for carving out a niche as a kind of hard running third tall who push up really high up the ground, accumulating possessions, but also hitting the scoreboard as well. For most of his time at Adelaide, he averaged about 20 possessions, was good for a goal a game, and in 2013 was actually Adelaide's leading goal kicker. Stats won't quite reflect the impact that Tom Lynch had when he was playing really well, and he was also part of a pretty successful period for Adelaide as a key player during that time. His time at Adelaide recently came to an end after 152 games and 193 goals for that footy club. So guys, so that is the 10 that I've nominated for this particular video. I have thrown a few honorable mentions out there. I've gone with Jay Shules, Sam Jacobs, Tom Hickey, Shane Mumford, and Ted Richards as other players that more or less ascended far beyond what people expected at the time of them being traded. 
One player that I did consider putting in this video is Jake Stringer, but I eventually left him out because it still remains to be seen whether he can maintain the heights that he reached this year. I think definitely 2021 was his best season. He also played some very, very good football for the Bulldogs. So if he can sustain his current level of form, I believe he was ranked the number one player in the league in the second half of the year, according to some sort of ranking. If he can sustain that, then I think he qualifies for this list. But that also got me thinking, who out there do you think will qualify for this list somewhere down the future? Maybe someone like a Jai Caldwell, maybe a Sam Petrevsky. Season. Nah, but as always, keen to get your thoughts on this particular topic, guys. Hope you're still enjoying the videos. Would appreciate if you could subscribe to the channel if you are still enjoying them. And if you haven't subscribed, like the video if you did enjoy it. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys.